All right, let's uh, get started. Uh, I don't see Rob, but I suspect he's there and I just don't see him. Uh, the speaker tonight is Rob Steenberg, uh, AD0IU. He's a space scientist at the Space Weather Prediction Center of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, known as NOAA to some of us. Uh, and he's going to talk tonight, I think, about space weather and other related topics. So, Rob, uh, if you are willing to take off, feel free. All right. Let me see if I can get this show on the road. Now, let's see. Share screen. All right. With any luck, you're seeing my screen. So, um, yeah, thank you for the introduction and for the uh, invitation uh, to come talk to the group. Uh, I was looking over the presentations uh, from the uh, previous months and, and was really impressed. Um, I saw, and I had a slide in here for HamSci, but I saw you guys had a presentation on that last time, so I didn't need to, I, I don't even need to have that slide in here. But uh, yeah, so, I'm going to talk about uh, space weather and uh, what is it and why do I care? Um, I need to acknowledge some of my colleagues here. Uh, there were several people. I've got a, a few slides in here about the solar activity of September 6th or 8th back in 2017. Um, those include uh, Patricia Doherty from uh, Boston University and uh, my colleagues at SWIPC, Mihail Kodrescu and George Millward. Um, solar cycle projections, uh, courtesy of Doug Biesecker, who uh, leads or co-leads the uh, Solar Cycle Prediction Committee. And then uh, Dolores Knipp of CU Boulder uh, provided some of the historical information you'll see, and she's done some uh, nice articles about that. As a little aside, just to give you a little more insight into Rob, um, I learned a valuable lesson uh, back in 2010, when I was routinely commuting between Houston, Texas, where I worked at NASA, and uh, my home here in Colorado, uh, where my wife and kids still were. The valuable lesson is, don't wind um, inductors in the boarding area at DIA. It makes people nervous. So, uh, a lady sat down next to me as I was wire, winding magnet wire around a PVC pipe and she looked at me and I looked at her and smiled and went back to winding and uh, wasn't too long after that I got finished up and putting uh, putting things away and a Denver police officer said so what you doing I said oh I've been working on a radio he says ah oh. I said I don't want you to freak out but uh, about a minute or so seven guys are gonna come surround you. Uh, don't freak out, just stay seated. And uh, it kind of evolved from there. But um, bottom line, I didn't get through security for the next four years without some type of investigation. <laughs> so that's my, uh, that's a little bit more um, about me. So I haven't been through airports in a while, obviously. So what we'll look at today is an overview of space weather phenomena and impacts. Um, the, we'll talk more about the events of September 2017 because that was the largest series of events of Solar Cycle 24. Um, we'll also look at a CME that happened while I was on duty on the forecast desk one evening in July of 2012. Uh, I'll talk about some tips for amateur radio and then we'll wrap it up. I'm going to go close the door here real quick. Forgot to do that. All right, so we'll start off with one of the reasons I care. Um, I started my uh, space weather career in the Air Force. I'd previously been a weather forecaster uh, for Earth weather for 20 years, but uh, after 20 years of, of, of really wrong forecast, the Air Force said, you know, maybe you do better in space. It's bigger and not a lot of people live there. Um, and so began my journey. Uh, but it's important to the military. This was an event that occurred in the 1960s uh, during the Cold War. Um, I believe it um, preceded 
the um, the missile crisis, but uh, we had radar, and, and a lot of you may know this, we had radar up uh, in the Arctic Circle um, looking for intercontinental ballistic missiles from the Soviet Union. And the doctrine of the day said, you know, if you're going to attack uh, using those missiles, the first thing you want to do is take out the enemy's radar so they don't know that they're coming and they don't know where they're going to land. Uh, well, on this particular day in May, there was a simultaneous outage of the entire radar network. And that outage uh, that we experienced uh, was also um, experienced on the other side of the globe. And that triggered a lot of warning bells uh, for a lot of different people. And it resulted in uh, the folks in Cheyenne Mountain scrambling the crews, the B-52 crews, um, at SAC bases who went out to the aircraft and started getting them spun up while well, they tried to figure out what happened. Well, at some point, um, one of the weathermen who was in the mountains stood up and said, this might be a, a solar event. And so, while well, he went to work checking that out, um, he bought a little time, for global nuclear annihilation, um, they did in fact determine that uh, there had been a solar event and a large radio burst, which happened to be on the same frequency that those radars operated on, had occurred. Um, it trashed the ionosphere, it uh, brought that radar network down. Um, and the important thing is, you know, they had enough time and they realized what had happened, so they were able to stand down the crews and not launch. But had they launched, um, it would have been virtually impossible to call them back because the state of the ionosphere was such that they wouldn't have been able to contact the aircraft. So this was a huge event, um, and it was really a catalyst uh, for space weather, at least in the military, um, to be recognized and uh, effort devoted towards understanding it and predicting it. So, what makes our star special? It's got three things that we need uh, to produce space weather. They include magnetism, convection, and differential rotation. So our star has magnetic fields uh, that it develops uh, through motions within the solar interior. And those magnetic fields eventually get brought to the surface. They get pushed up. The different, and that's through convection, the differential rotation piece of it is the sun rotates faster at the equator than it does at the pole. So those magnetic field lines get twisted. And the more twisted those magnetic fields become, and the more of them that protrude, giving us spot, sunspots, the more likely we are to have a large solar event. Um, I'm just changing my view here. There we go. Um, and kind of the rule of thumb, you can see the evolution of a sunspot group here. If you go from left to right, um, you can see where we have some very small spots that start out. They continue to emerge throughout the period until they become huge and very complex magnetically. And your probability pretty much runs the course from left to right. The larger the spots and the more complex they are, the more likely we are to have a significant solar flare. So, as radio amateurs, uh, I guess many of you are probably interested in the solar cycle prediction. And here it is, um, as it stands right now. You can see uh, here in 2020, we kind of bottom out. And there has been, or there have been signs, and, and many of you are probably following this, uh, that we're beginning our journey, uh, our ascent into the next solar max. And for me, that's exciting. And I know for many people, it probably is as well. Um, in September, so about a month from now, uh, there should be an announcement because they're, the team that looks at this stuff has been looking at this minimum period here and trying to make the 
the call on whether or not we have uh, actually hit and passed solar min. We don't know necessarily that we've uh, achieved it until after it has occurred. You know, we say uh, trends are moving upward. Now I've got a link here um, that you can go to uh, to see this solar cycle progression. And this, this particular graph indicates the um, sunspot progression and the forecast in red. And the next slide shows the F10.7 solar flux. And you can see here, uh, we've got a prediction that peaks out around 1.30, although uh, that's the official prediction from the um, Solar Cycle Prediction Committee. Uh, there are other researchers out there um, who are expecting a slightly larger cycle up in the 150s. Um, and these forecasts always come with error bars. Um, so you can put, you know, plus or minus 10 or so on each side and probably be in the ballpark. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, real quick, just to look at that uh, page, that web page. If it'll load, there we go. One thing I'd like to point out is the graphs here. If you're used to going to the Space Weather Prediction web page in the past, and that's got an easy URL too, it's uh, just spaceweather.gov. Um, the plots we used to have were not interactive. You couldn't mess with them. Uh, these plots, however, are. Uh, you can click and zoom and, and print charts and do all sorts of neat stuff. Um, so there's an example of how we slid into solar minimum. And you can see the data read out there. So it's this for us is pretty, pretty new and exciting. Um, gives you some options. The, uh, print options and things are here. So there you go. And you can see it extends back. We've got it back to 2005, um, but you can move those sliders around too. So that's a neat tool just to keep track of where we are in the cycle. Um, get back to presentation. All right, did I lose my slot? My, uh... All right, there we are. Okay, so it's an 11 year solar cycle on average. Uh, it can be longer or shorter. Um, the last cycle we had 24 wasn't the smallest we've ever seen, but it, for a solar cycle, it was pretty um, not as impressive as it could have been. So what are the effects that we're looking for from our star? Um, there's, I call them the big three, uh, R, S, and G. Radio blackouts, um, which are driven by solar flares, and they have a uh, pronounced effect on our ionosphere on the sunlit side of the Earth and they cause radio blackouts. The S stands for space radiation storm because we'd already used the R for radio blackouts. Um, space radiation storms are, uh, can be coincident with uh, flares and driven by uh, coronal mass ejections, which are events in which giant blobs of plasma are blown off the solar uh, surface out through the atmosphere and into interplanetary space. I like to think of it as um, interplanetary projectile vomit from the sun uh, because that's what it looks like when you model it. Those, um, like I said, can drive space radiation storms. Space radiation storms um, pose a threat not only to uh, spacecraft and the internal electronics uh, because these high energy particles can get buried in the electronics and cause bit flips and other problems um, in some cases can cause total uh, loss of the spacecraft um, but they also threaten human life um, particularly the astronauts on the International Space Station um, if for a large enough event um, a, it will mean that they shouldn't go outside on extravehicular activities 
because they could receive their lifetime radiation dose. They're considered radiation workers, so they have a, a lifetime dose limit. Um, and if they exceed that on a, on a spacewalk, they can't go into space anymore. So that's a big deal. Um, additionally, if the, if the event's strong enough, they'll actually have to move inside the space station to a place that's more well shielded from the effects of these storms. And then finally, geomagnetic storms are associated with those coronal mass ejections I mentioned earlier. Uh, those coronal mass ejections, as they move away from the sun, from the solar atmosphere, they contain um, magnetic fields that are frozen in and they come towards Earth when they're Earth directed. And eventually when they reach our magnetosphere, they'll interact with our magnetosphere. And depending on how well they stick, just like uh, refrigerator magnets, um, if the if the poles are aligned correctly, um, you will see large geomagnetic storms generated as these uh, blobs of plasma pass by Earth. Uh, this is of particular interest to the utilities, the electric utilities in particular, um, because they have gigantic conductors uh, that stretch over hundreds and thousands of miles, and these big conductors, uh, under the influence of a fluctuating magnetic field, uh, can get unwanted current. They also affect pigeon racers, because if you release your pigeons in a geomagnetic storm, they're not going to come back. And we get calls from pigeon racers who are getting ready to launch their birds, wanting to know what the geomagnetic situation is like. I had never had any interaction with the pigeon racing community until I came to work at Swipsy. So I didn't really know about them. And I thought, well, you can get another pigeon. I mean, they're all over the place, but that's not true. These are thoroughbreds. These are racing pigeons. And I found out the most expensive one, uh, and, and the one that holds the record now for the highest priced pigeon, uh, to sell uh, was a quarter of a million dollars. So pigeons can be expensive. Other things uh, that they're finding the magnetic field can affect um, include dogs. So I may mention that a little bit more later. But you can see this is this is really how we monitor the solar environment. We have uh, telescopes both on the ground and in space. Uh, that'll show us where the sunspots are. Um, additionally, we have sensors in the extreme ultraviolet and X-ray wavelengths that can help us pinpoint flare activity. And then these two images are from an instrument called uh, LASCO aboard a spacecraft called SOHO. And LASCO is a um, coronagraph. And what the coronagraph does is creates an artificial eclipse on the brightest part of the sun, so we can see the outer solar atmosphere. And there's uh, two different versions. One has a larger field of view. Um, and we use these images not only to alert us that a coronal mass ejection has happened, but also uh, to serve as input uh, to our numerical models uh, of the blob of plasma and help us predict its arrival time. Unfortunately, uh, we have nothing that can really tell us right now about the magnetic field inside the plasma blob. And that's kind of a problem because that's the key, knowing the orientation and magnitude of that magnetic field uh, will tell you what the impact that Earth is going to be. So that's one of, the, one of the big questions out there. One of the big challenges is to find a way to identify that. The uh, sequence of events typically um, and this comes from NASA, that you'll, you'll have an area that flares. So you see brightening. The blob of plasma gets ejected. And typically this is a function of those magnetic field lines finally shearing and then reconnecting. And in that process, it can drive off a large blob of plasma into interplanetary space. And that's what you see here. Um, it'll move out through space if it's Earth-directed, comes our way interacts with our magnetosphere, 
uh, if it interacts uh, strongly, these field lines that you see will break and reconnect in the magneto tail, as shown here. Um, and then that will accelerate particles back towards Earth into the poles, and you'll get aurora. So it's a, it's a really neat uh, sequence of events. Um, the key here is that the time from the flare uh, to its impact at Earth can be as little as 17 hours or so, or as many as four or five days. Um, they tend to uh, travel at different speeds based on their origin. Uh, these do not have to occur in conjunction with a large solar flare. Uh, there are also features on the sun called solar filaments, um, which I like to think of as sinister mustaches um, in one of the wavelengths that we look at. That's how they appear. Um, but those can lift off the sun, and those are typically slow and usually bring uh, magnetic storms of lesser magnitude. So we've talked about the radio blackouts, the space radiation storms, and the geomagnetic storms a little bit. So what's a typical event look like? Generally, you'll see a large X-ray flare. You may get a radio burst as well in conjunction with that flare. We can forecast flares uh, probabilistically. So we can give you, just like you can say, 20% chance of rain. I can say 20% chance of M flares. Um, but that's the best we can do. Right now, I have nothing equivalent to what I had in the um, meteorological world, uh, like a tornado warning. For flares, I have nothing like that. That will occur when we, when we detect a flare, it's already happened eight minutes ago at the sun and gotten here at the speed of light, and gotten to our detectors aboard the uh, GOES spacecraft, the same one that give you the wonderful weather satellite images also or have an instrument or instruments pointed at the sun to tell us about the solar activity. Um, if we think the flare uh, is of a magnitude and we have a statistical program that will tell us about this, um, we will issue a warning for energetic particles for the space radiation storm. Um, and that radiation storm can arrive very promptly in minutes, um, but it can take several hours as well uh, to arrive. If we do have a particle event and it interacts uh, with the polar regions, uh, you can have what's called a polar cap absorption event, uh, in which case the D region uh, becomes uh, highly absorptive, it's highly ionized, and you can't transmit uh, radio waves effectively through it without them being absorbed, uh, at least on HF. And this is a, this is a significant issue, and um, it can last for days. So that can be problematic for uh, the aviation industry, for instance, who likes to fly over the poles uh, to shorten their routes. Um, when one of these occurs, they have to divert and fly in the pre or in the uh, Soviet era flight paths, and uh, it burns a lot more fuel and makes the, the dollar signs just a roll. And I get a lot of phone calls. Once it happens, the next set of phone calls I get are when's it going to be over? And that's from the airlines and from uh, NASA, from the, from the folks uh, watching the space station. And then finally, uh, the solar plasma, the coronal mass ejection, or the geomagnetic storm. Uh, this is the only thing where we can issue a watch. We have enough time. It's like a hurricane watch. Uh, we have enough time to uh, decide if we think this thing is going to impact Earth. We can let people know right away. We say, look, this looks good. Um, and back in those earlier photos, um, if I can go backwards. Let's see. No, I'm going to click. All right, let me, uh, there we go. Okay, in these earlier images, um, notice in the chronograph how this looks like a big halo right here. Those are in fact called halo CMEs, and those are the ones that are earth directed. So when they're looking straight on, it comes at you and expands like a giant expanding donut of doom. And uh, the problem though that we have is they look exactly the same if, our, if they're on the opposite side of the sun from the Earth, moving away from us. So that's problematic. 
Um, and we have another spacecraft up there that can help us uh, make the determination of which way it's going. So we can put the watch out, and then as it comes closer, it will intersect a satellite at the L1 Lagrange point, which is about um, a million miles away from Earth, and it will, uh, it's kind of our warning buoy, like a, like a ocean buoy out in the Gulf warning you of the approaching hurricane. This is, uh, this is out there um, giving us some advance warning uh, that the thing is here, and this is the first actual glimpse we get of the magnetic field. And um, based on what we're seeing, and we can issue uh, a warning and, and give a kind of an estimate for the magnitude. And then once it hits our magnetosphere, we'll detect it on the GO spacecraft, followed quickly uh, by magnetometers on the ground. Um, and that will be the commencement of the magnetic storm. And that can last a while, depending on the, uh, uh, typically one CME, last about a day or so. But um, if you have, you can have more than one, you can have several back to back, in which case we get just slammed over and over again. And pigeons really don't go anywhere. The uh, R, S, and G uh, scales that we created um, probably two decades ago at least, um, try to capture the magnitude of the effects and the probability of the effects um, as well as describing them for the different types of phenomena. So for radio blackouts, for instance, those are linked to x-ray flares. The scale runs from one to five, just like the hurricane scale or the um, enhanced Fujita scale for tornadoes, um, runs from minor to extreme. They are based on the level of X-ray flux that we record at the GOES spacecraft. And then the final column gives you an estimate of how often they occur per a given solar cycle based on the data we've collected. We have the same thing for radiation storms and the same for geomagnetic storms. And then the text in the middle is uh, an indication of what types of effects in what user communities would be affected by the different phenomena. So these are really handy to have. And I've in included a link up there to them. Now, the one thing that has been a real privilege for me after moving from meteorology into space weather is to watch the kind of um, explosion of numerical modeling um, that's making its way into space weather. Uh, I was fortunate when I joined the Air Force in the 80s, uh, you know, numerical modeling had already been happening for 30 years uh, for weather forecasts, but I got to watch the, the steady improvement of these numerical models and the introduction of new sources of data uh, like Doppler radar um, and enhanced SCOES imagery uh, that really made it amazing and it really improved the forecast. So that by the time I left meteorology, um, the opportunities for a human to add value to the forecast, actually refine it and make it better, uh, were becoming smaller and smaller. And typically, uh, in many cases, just limited to the uh, severe events with the short fuse warnings and, and um, things that you'd issue in a forecast office. In space weather, that wasn't the case. We had just started with numerical models. So it was, uh, it was the wide open frontier. For instance, there, none of this existed when I came to work there. And I've been there only a decade. So this last decade has been just absolutely amazing. Um, the first model uh, that we introduced operationally was the uh, WSA NLO model, uh, which is two things, the wang shili argy model, which tries to capture uh, the background solar wind, and then the NLO model, which tries to then um, project uh, CMEs uh, or, in, or allows you to inject CMEs into the model, into the background solar wind, and watch them evolve. Um, so this is just an event from 2011. Um, here you're looking down uh, from what would be the North Pole of the Sun, uh, and you're uh, 
seeing the CME cloud here, and then Earth is this tiny green dot there. Uh, so you can see how massive these things are. This is just a slice through the Sun-Earth line showing you uh, its orientation basically vertically. Uh, these are indications of solar wind speed. So that's what the shading represents. And the CME arrival then is depicted where this yellow line is. You can see the bump in speed at Earth, that green line. And then down here, you can see a similar bump in density. So as this thing plows through space, you know, it's kind of collecting things in front of it like a big snow plow. Um, so you'll see a density increase as it passes. These two images are models of Earth's magnetic field and magnetosphere. So here we're seeing the change in the magnetic field over time. Uh, this is from an incident in uh, 2016. So you can see a large storm and a disturbed magnetic field in the, um, over Canada and in the polar regions. Uh, these are cross-cut slices through Earth's magnetosphere. So you can see Earth here, a solar wind is coming at us from the left side of the screen. And you can see the change as the, as the CME starts to pass by. You can see how it's compressed towards Earth and flattened a little bit. So these two pieces um, are brand new and are, and are an amazing addition uh, to our arsenal of forecasting tools. And then finally, this is the latest addition uh, in the lower left, or lower right, I'm sorry, um, that shows the uh, induced electric field from these magnetic fluctuations. And this is a particularly uh, important product for the power industry because they would like to be able to superimpose these electric fields over models of their grid, of their distribution system, to see where problems could occur. Prior to the advent of this model, the best we could do was give them something called a geomagnetic K index, which runs from zero to nine and is a planetary index. So I could issue a K, uh, KP alert for uh, nine, which is the strongest it can be. And an operator in Michigan would be seeing something totally different than somebody in Texas. And this was a problem. You know, they, they could have protocols that they do during these events, but uh, they didn't make sense in some cases. So to have a more refined picture of what's going on with the electric field is a big deal. So I've got a reference and impacts from the different phenomena here, but I've already kind of talked about them. The flares, uh, they last from tens of minutes to several hours. Um, radiation storms uh, can last for several days. The geomagnetic storm typically can last for a day or a little more, unless you have back-to-back -back CMEs. Um, I think I mentioned most of these effects. Um, yeah, I talked about those, talked about that. Um, one thing I didn't talk about in the geomagnetic storms, after the storm's over, uh, because of the changes that it drives in the ionosphere, you can have a de depression of the maximum usable frequency. And those maximum usable frequency uh, depressions can last for days, and uh, that will cause problems for uh, HF operations. Additionally, uh, these storms can trigger changes in the ionosphere that give rise to uh, problems with the global navigation satellite system. It can cause scintillation, um, which introduces fading and phase changes uh, that disrupt the reception of those signals. And finally, we get the Aurora, which is actually the most popular page uh, on the Swift Sea website. How do we get the information out? We send it out by telephone for high stakeholder or high or critical uh, stakeholders uh, like Nash, NASA, FEMA, commercial airlines, uh, power distribution, and so on. So we have a, a subset of customers that we'll call directly. Um, we also have an email-based product subscription service. Um, you can sign up for that. Uh, there's a, at the top of our web page, there's a little link that says subscribe, and you can get those delivered to you. Now, I'll warn you though, during high activity, those uh, emails can be delayed up to a half hour or more. We've, we've noticed in high activity times. 
Our website's always there. It's updated as well, so that's a nice place to go to check things out. If we have time, we'll post things to social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and then traditional media will come for big events and they'll do, uh, or they'll call us and do interviews for radio, um, or they'll send camera folks out to do television interviews. So it gets really busy. All right. By the way, any questions so far? I'm just cruising along, so things, feel free to interrupt me if you got questions. All right, I'll keep pressing. So, as we entered September of 2017, uh, well, for the, for the preceding months, things were relatively uneventful uh, for the solar cycle. And keep in mind, the solar cycle, cycle 24, peaked in 2014. So we're already on the downhill slope. And not much is happening, and then shazam. Things take off, and we get lots of flares. Um, you can see the sunspot number uh, goes way up. Uh, we have big particle events here. We have, um, you can see the fluctuations in the GOES magnetometer, so the magnetometer on the geosynchronous satellite goes crazy because we're getting slammed by coronal mass ejections. Uh, this was the culprit, region 12673. You can see Earth's size in relation to this sunspot group. And here's kind of a, uh, an enhanced version of the September um, time period when all this was going on. You can see some strong uh, X flares here and here. Um, these indicate particle events. This was a particularly abrupt one. These are the ones I hate as a forecaster because I have very little time to analyze the situation and get a warning out the door in a time that's meaningful for the folks who need to take action. So those are called prompt events. Um, see, here we track the flux of electrons. A buildup of electrons on spacecraft surfaces can cause dielectric or can cause discharges uh, that can create problems for the spacecraft. And then here, again, we're looking at the magnetic field. You can see as the coronal mass ejections uh, impacted Earth, you had significant disruption in the magnetic field. And this was between 8th and 9th. Here is the solar cycle. Like I said, we were already on the downslope. I mean, we were pretty far down, if you think about it. Um, and that's one of the things we like to remind people, just because you're not in solar maximum, it doesn't doesn't preclude a large event from happening. Some of the largest events have had happened uh, not at solar max, but either on the upslope or the downslope. Now, uh, this is just a chart that shows the different types of watches, warnings, and alerts um, that we issued during that period in September from the 1st through the 16th. Um, X-ray events are here. Um, Radio bursts are here, and you can see there are quite a few. Um, high energy particle proton events are here. And then down here, are your geomagnetic events. And you can see uh, we got up to uh, KP of eight um, around the eighth and ninth. And we had a, a subsequent storm of lesser magnitude later in the month. So we had an X 9.3 flare on September 6 at 12.02. And that was the largest of the solar cycle. And it was the largest we'd had um, in 12 years. So that was fairly uh, impressive. Um, it was, uh, there was an X2.2 that came before it. So we had an indication that there was gonna be X flare activity. And then it was followed by uh, some other X flares on the 7th and 10th. So it was a very active period in that, that particular region. Uh, was pretty potent. Here's what it did on the 6th of September to the ionosphere. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, that was our X9 flare. You can see there's where the sunlit side of the Earth was. Here's the attenuation, um, and here are your frequencies that are attenuated. So you can see it took out a pretty big chunk. Um, the amount of attenuation is listed at the bottom here in dB. Um, 
and the frequencies affected are shading. Um, so you can see it got up into the high frequencies uh, or the upper end of the HF scale uh, over a large portion of the sun facing part of the globe. Now, I'm not sure how many of you remember, um, but there were, uh, there were significant activity out in the Western Atlantic. I'll mention that more, and we'll look at that more in a minute. This is a useful, useful chart if you're operating. Um, if you're on the air, um, this is a handy thing to have as the activity picks up. It gives you an estimated recovery time, uh, both for the high latitude proton events as well as the mid to low latitude x-rays. Uh, so it looks like this event, you know, they're thinking it'll wrap up in a couple hours. Uh, the proton event's going to last longer. And these are revised uh, as the model's updated. Uh, and they're based on empirical relationships. So it's not a physics-driven model. Um, it's basically statistics for what we have now. This was uh, information from the weak signal propagation reporter that I was able to download. And that, that has been a very... Um, a very helpful uh, tool for me as a space scientist to look at impacts. Of course, here I picked out the, uh, some of the relevant uh, HF bands for amateurs. Um, and you can see how everything nosedives in the wake of the X2. Uh, we start to recover and nosedives again. Uh, now, the nice thing is that so, and, and one thing that you, you need to remember during these flares uh, and afterwards, particularly afterwards, and this is gonna, it's gonna knock things out for a while, but when it comes back, you just pumped a lot of energy in there, so you're gonna have a lot of ionization. So notice the number of connections takes off. And this, keep in mind too, I, I need to caveat this, this is, this is global. This is, I'm not just limiting this uh, analysis to the sunlit side of the Earth. I just took everything they had and uh, plotted it out here. But you can see this beautiful rebound. It's really nice. But there were hurricanes in the Gulf. And I was interested in the impacts of this event on the Hurricane WatchNet. Um, so I contacted uh, the person leading that effort and uh, they told me straight up the flares could not happen at a worse time. They had three hurricanes threatening land and they couldn't make contact with anyone on 20 or 40 uh, where they operate. Um, so this, that was a significant impact. Now, I talked to, uh, I've talked to some FEMA officials and uh, some FEMA officials have said there wasn't really any impact to FEMA communications at all. Um, and those were people kind of at the top of the response chain. Um, but I also talked to people down in the trenches who straight up said, yeah, there were. <laughs> so, um, but the, the folks brought up a good point um, in that, you know, these, here you're relying a lot on voice communications, um, but they had digital communications and they had, uh, you know, transmitters with reasonable power and ways of you know, helping mitigate some of these impacts. So I guess the bottom line is, um, you know, the HF bands are gonna be affected, but a lot depends on your station and its configuration and the type of mode you're using to communicate. It's gonna be real interesting for me to see how FTA responds, uh, you know, during the upcoming cycle. There were radio bursts. Um, the USAF, Air Force Observatory in Italy, uh, reported radio bursts um, at 1415 megahertz, which is um, close to uh, GPS frequencies. And you can see radio burst impacts um, to GPS on 6 September. You can see some fades that occurred on the L2 frequency and on L1. Uh, they were less pronounced, uh, but still there. And this was um, this was actually over, uh, reported by stations over in Europe. Uh, the fade on L1 was 1 dB, 3 dB on uh, L2, um, and then uh, a maximum of about six. So the forecasting, uh, how do we do it? Uh, for the geomagnetic storms, remember I told you about the coronagraph imagery? Here we have, um, 
we have processed the coronagraph imagery in a way to make the coronal mass ejection more visible. Um, and using this imagery, we can then parameterize the CME using this tool. And that gives us things like the speed of the CME, the direction it's traveling, and its angular width. And those pieces then, we can feed into our numerical model and come up with an arrival time. And the arrival time has improved our capabilities from about plus or minus 12 hours to about plus or minus seven. The next stop is the ACE spacecraft or the Discover spacecraft at the L1 Lagrange point. Um, that's about a hundredth of the way uh, to the sun away from the earth. And that's our buoy that I mentioned. So we wait to see the arrival of the CME reflected in the magnetic field, speed and density and temperature. The key thing here is what portion of the magnetic field associated with that CME is southward. The further southward and the longer that southward uh, directed magnetic field is, the more potent the CME is gonna be in terms of geomagnetic storming. Then finally, we have ground magnetometers well, where, where we monitor the situation as well. And that's how we come up with that planetary index of geomagnetic upheaval um, using the ground magnetometers, using actually several of them. So on 6 September, uh, you can see the chain of events. There's the flare, there's the CME. Um, here's our forecast. We are going for uh, conditions as high as G3, which is strong geomagnetic storming. You can see that here. Uh, this was in our forecast on the 7th. Now the CME arrived and strong would be about seven. So we, we crept over, actually, minor, moderate, yep, strong. So it actually crept up one notch higher, got up to eight for a couple periods um, on the eighth at the end of this, between the seventh and eighth. And then again on the eighth, uh, you can see the impacts here. This is the mag field. You can see the second shock was pretty pronounced and drove the southward component of the magnetic field pretty far south. Um, here you can look at particle density. So this part, these particles are swept up ahead of the CME and accelerated. And you see as the CME arrived, it drove them up. And then again, the second round came in. Uh, and then wind speed. Typically the solar wind's gonna sit around three to 400 kilometers per second. Um, and notice here it bumped up. We had a spike up to close to a thousand and then it came back down as these things passed. The um, geomagnetic storm also had an impact on the uh, GNSS support of the wide area augmentation system, which helps aircraft position themselves and, and do precision approaches. Uh, so you can see how oh, the storm took a bite out of the reliability over Florida and some of the southeastern states. Similar things happened over in Europe, uh, where it nibbled away at the northern edge of their augmentation system. So that was that was the the um, September 2017 events. In July 2012, I was working the forecast desk on a night shift, and I watched a CME happen. Um, this was it observed from the stereo spacecraft, which were one of two spacecraft that are uh, moving one faster than Earth's orbit and one slower uh, around the sun. Uh, one of those spacecraft has since died, but the other one remains active and is situated over here. In any case, uh, this thing blew up and I saw it was huge. And I said, this is gonna be good. Well, it hit that spacecraft. The spacecraft happened to be in the perfect position and they're designed for this. They're designed to monitor these things. So it captured the magnetic field and that magnetic field is shown in uh, the shaded areas here. You can see the, the uh, total magnetic field here um, in gray and the 
southward component of the magnetic field in red. They were looking for an analog to this storm because they said, what if this had hit Earth? You know, we definitely had a stronger, um, more pronounced total field and BZ was pretty significant, the southward component. The closest analog they could find was the, um, a storm that occurred uh, in July uh, 2000 called the Bastille Day storm. And that's indicated here in the line plots. So you can see it was similar and what the Bastille Day storm gave us was three consecutive periods and each of these periods is three hours. So um, nine hours of KP of nine, which is as, as much as it gets. And unfortunately the scale saturates. So, you know, even if you keep going beyond that in terms of magnitude, nine is as high as you'll ever see, followed by an eight. So that was a big deal. Um, one of the researchers with the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at CU, uh, Dan Baker, who's, who's pretty widely regarded in the space weather community, said, you know, if it hit, we'd still be picking up the pieces. Fortunately, it was directed away from us, so it didn't hit us. And people have asked me what he meant by picking up the pieces. And I think uh, Dan can sometimes be very enthusiastic, but I think... Uh, I think what he's saying was that, uh, you know, this could have had significant effects, uh, things like power outages and significant damage to spacecraft and things like that. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a big deal. And so we missed this by three days. The region that produced this had rotated, the sun rotates, um, if you're looking at it from left to right, and it rotates in a complete revolution every 27 days. So you've got two weeks basically of watching this thing move across the disk. And I watched it get bigger and bigger and you know, probabilistically it looked like it was gonna do something, but it wasn't until it had gone over the edge, over the um, edge of the solar disk and rotated around about three days before it produced something like this. So we missed it by about three days. You can see, um, here I've got uh, pictures of a uh, CME on July 23rd that happened on the far side of the sun. Again, this was another large event. Um, you can see some beautiful pictures here. Um, and here, these are from the stereo spacecraft. Uh, you saw an impact at Stereo A on 24 to 25 July. That's where Stereo A was. Earth is here, so notice it was directed away from us. But again, huge impact in the magnetic field. It dropped below minus 40 nanoteslas, which is, in space weather uh, uh, terms, that's a big deal. That's a, that's a real big deal. And uh, similarly, you can see the velocity jumped way up, um, close to 1,000 kilometers per second. Um, yeah, it was, it was huge. Here are periods with uh, KP greater than or equal to the extreme uh, that we saw. And this goes back several solar cycles all the way back to 1933. So you can see each solar cycle had their share. They're not very common. Obviously, this was, this was a really interesting year. Um, this was the uh, 1954 to 1964 uh, solar cycle 19. Um, and I think some folks, uh, if you were alive then and on amateur radio, uh, I've heard stories from that era that just make me jealous. Um, <laughs> as you can see here, we had none in solar cycle 24. We had no KP and nine events. So that's, that's interesting. Um, what it means for me as a forecaster and someone who trains forecasters is none of my guys have seen you know, I've got one, well, I've got two folks who remember this solar cycle. I've got none who, who uh, remember before that. And look, we only had two of those, uh, or two, two instances. Um, they had three periods, so nine hours in this particular case. But my guys have never seen that. So trying to convey what that's like not only to my forecasters, but also to the folks who depend on us, like the power industry, to get them to understand what that means uh, is tough. Um, we can also get minor 
magnetic storms from features called coronal holes. This is one of them. Um, they are areas of the corona where um, high speed solar wind escapes. Um, it's moving so fast that it blows out any structure here, which is why it looks dark. Um, and those rotate with the sun. They come around and come around every 27 days and, and hose down Earth. Um, and it's basically jiggling our field. So generally we get um, active uh, geomagnetic conditions below storm level or minor storming out of these. But the problem is if you combine one of these with a coronal mass ejection, all bets are off and it can be really ugly. Um, and just here are some coronal hole images as well from different rotations. Um, you can see that. Now what was interesting was they picked this pattern up in the magnetometer data before we ever were able to even see these. Um, it wasn't until the immediately before and then the Skylab year where they really understood that these existed. And uh, so prior to that, they had these things that they knew came around every 27 days. They didn't know what they were, so they called them M regions. M was for mysterious, which I thought was very appropriate. Here's another one of our numerical models. This forecasts the aurora and the potential for viewing the aurora. We just had a recent upgrade to it, which should be available shortly. Um, that will include, um, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, auroral absorption uh, potential for HF as well. Now I got some hints. What do you do as a ham radio operator? These are all from uh, NA5N um, and the QRP, Amateur Radio Club International. Um, this individual works out at the very large array. Um, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now, but anyhow, um, he's posted a lot of and written a lot of good articles, both on um, equipment construction as well as the space weather uh, presentation he put together for um, the QRP ARCI meeting that they have in conjunction with the Dayton Ham Convention. Um, if you have a so some hints and these apply not only to QRP but to anybody. Um, you know, if you get wiped out with a flare, take a break. Um, but when you come back, like I showed you in that plot from the Whisper Networks, uh, you're going to have uh, a really pumped up ionosphere that would allow you to uh, really exploit that condition. Um, so they work immediately from uh, following a solar flare until sundown. Now that precludes any more big flares coming. Um, so you get better S and R, um, and it's really nice. Um, another thing to remember, uh, the HF effects generally only for the duration of the flare, which typically wraps up in an hour and seldom affects frequencies um, below 10 megahertz. You're not relying on, on that uh, particular portion. Um, more propagation hints. Yeah, use the K index from Doug. You can still get it on WWV. We almost, they wanted us to take the space broadcast off of WWV, but we got so many, so much feedback um, that said no, that uh, it's still there. So you can hear it at um, say between eight and 18 minutes past the hour. Um, but look at the conditions. The A index is a summary of the past 24 hours, so it's good for yesterday, but not present. Um, after a strong geomagnetic storm, you can get um, things quieting down. Uh, look at 40 through 160 meters, uh, because you might have low noise levels there. Um, and he's got some final thoughts here. The one thing I wanted to point to, though, is number five. Don't let reports of flares or geomagnetic storms or low F 10.7, deter you. you know, turn the radio on, go ahead and look around, see what's there, because we don't have the ability, you know, an, a global index is not going to capture all the intricacies of the ionosphere. So KP is not going to tell you everything. Um, you know that solar flares can, can actually improve things as they wind down, so don't, don't be deterred. Um, and even, even with the uh, from EF 10.7 values we've been having. Um, you know, I, you saw the number of contacts I made on FTA, it was just unbelievable. So, uh, you know, take advantage of the technology. Um, you know, don't let the environment deter you too much. Um, space weather operations, research and mitigation, SWARM, 
Um, this was started in the past administration, carried over into the new administration. Um, it is recognized at the highest levels that space weather can be a severe threat uh, to our nation and to the earth. Um, so legislation has been written and passed to make sure that we remain focused on this even during the low times like we're in now. I got a great comment from Calvin and Hobbes here. It said, why is the sun set? Because hot air rises. And because the sun's hot in the middle, it comes up high in the sky during the day. And it cools down in the evening and sets. And then he said, why does it go from east to west? And his dad said, solar wind. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. Some of the pictures down here are just uh, of our office and my colleagues. Um, we are here doing these two images, our folks doing drawings. We still do hand drawings of the sunspots and the other features we can pick out from the imagery. Um, this is a, a look at us during uh, high activity. Um, no, maybe not so high, there's only a couple people there. Um, typically, we always have two people on shift. Um, more if the situation warrants. Um, there's Monty looking at some data. We've got a lot more monitors in there now as well. It's pretty spectacular. Here's the evolution of a radio station. So that was my setup in 1980, Viking Ranger, Allied Receiver, and uh, got back into it. Like I said, in 2007, 2008, I had actually the same radio, <laughs> uh, but I had also borrowed one. Got into QRP around 2010, and you can see kind of the evolution here. And that is it for me. Rob, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. I learned a lot. I enjoy your presentations. Uh, do you have time to take a few questions if there are questions? Absolutely. Does anybody uh, want to ask a question? Go ahead and speak up. This is Lauren. Um, Rob, I've got a, a couple of questions. You kind of started to address it at the end. Um, you know, we're, I think we're accustomed to see on the QRZ homepage, there's a, um, um, a chart that um, uh, what, one of the uh, N0 um, EMH or BHN or um, something like that uh, publishes. Is there a, an index? So realizing that it's it as you said it's really hard to give a real good uh, prediction of what propagation is going to be but is there an indication that says if something happens i can expect to be do better on a particular band by some magnitude you know by by looking at the difference in the uh, solar flux index or maybe you know looking at the k uh, the KP number, is there something that would give me some indication that that conditions are improving and that I can do better or worse? I mean, I realize that you just, you know, you were showing us charts that an event happens, it may be bad, but it could be better shortly. Yeah. But, but just on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, should is the SFI the thing that we should be looking at uh, to get just kind of a general indication? Yeah, I think, I think you know, the solar flux is going to give you a general feel for things. Um, if you're looking, you know, like I've, I've messed around listening on, on 10 meters, and six meters, for instance, um, and, you know, and occasionally on, on 15 meters and had some surprises, you know, that, that I wasn't expecting. In general, the F10.7 is going to be a good guide. Um, what, and we make forecasts of that as well, a daily forecasts that are updated, um, that are included in our products. Uh, so you can see kind of uh, real time, these, these are not updated, they're updated on like a monthly basis. And the projections aren't, aren't refined that much, but uh, the daily forecasts do have some information about what we expect the trend to be. Um, and one thing that's kind of, you know, I mentioned a lot of numerical models. Um, one of the numerical models that is not operational yet, but should be uh, within the coming year, um, maybe in the coming six months, is called the whole atmosphere model or WAM. And uh, what scientists did was take a 
uh, the weather model that we use for the globe, the GFS or global forecast system, and they extended the upper boundary of it beyond uh, the troposphere and stratosphere and pushed it all the way up into the mesosphere and thermosphere. And that uh, encompasses our ionosphere and they're using uh, other models to augment it to give us ionospheric predictions. So that's gonna be a physics-based driven model that's gonna be able to tell us more um, about what we should be able to expect from the ionosphere. So I think as time goes on, that is a potential um, source of information. Now, the thing is, how do, you, how do you take that and derive propagation products from it and things like that? And that's something that, that I think we're gonna have to look into. I, I kind of tried to prod that effort in probably about five years ago or so um, with the folks who make uh, BOA cap. Um, because what I think would be nice is if you had a propagation model that you didn't just stick in the A index or KP or F10.7, but that was continuously updated, driven by a physics-based ionospheric model. So that's my that's my dream, and I think that eventually could have the potential to provide uh, more tailored information, like you're looking for. Um, the other thing I think would be useful, and I've I've talked to folks about it, is taking that DRAP model and trying to, uh, you know, right now it's it's got frequencies I believe in in just five. Um, megahertz increments like 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. And I wanted to see if we could get tailored pages just for the frequencies that we use. And I think uh, the gentleman I talked to who oversees that model said it would be uh, relatively easy. It's just a matter of trying to get it into the queue with all the other things we've got going on in terms of modeling. Um, another uh, quick one, and I think there might be some other general interest in this um, because we've got quite a few um, quite a few members that are 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 primarily operating VHF UHF, um, and most of the discussion and most of the impacts of the energetic particles seem to be affecting the uh, the ionosphere such that uh, HF gets most of the attention. Can you address? maybe a, a little bit more about what the impacts of solar events are on the uh, VHF and UHF frequencies? In general, um, the, solar, the solar events, um, you're typically not going to see much uh, that we can talk about uh, with the exception of the radio bursts that might occur on a frequency that's coincident with one you're using. Um, however, you know, there's sporadic E, and that is, um, at least in the, in the space weather, uh, operational space weather community that I'm living in, um, not well understood or not understood enough to give us any kind of predictive capability yet that I'm aware of. Now, the interesting, I, I uh, was recently in a in a course at uh, CU uh, looking at the upper atmosphere. One of the one of my fellow students was uh, doing research on sporadic E triggered by earthquakes, um, which yeah, which was really interesting. Um, so there, <laughs> so there may be some potential there, um, but they were still trying to understand the mechanisms that they were noticing, you know, correlation between these things. Um, so. Uh, from that, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know that I'd go as far to say, uh, you know, just look for earthquakes and <laughs> look for sporadic E, you know, but uh, I don't think we're there yet, but I, I think that's an area that looks interesting. Of course, we can't really predict the earthquakes yet either. So again, the predictive capability is going to be tough. So overall, I think that uh, right now, I don't think beyond the radio bursts, we have a whole lot to offer VHF and UHF. Um, now that, you know, I'm starting to get intrigued by it. You know, I've, I've operated uh, two meters and stuff, but I, I never messed around with six meters. I'm starting to get interested in that. So, you know, I, I may be delving deeper and poking some of my colleagues some more to try and <laughs> see what we can do. Thanks. Uh, any other questions, uh, people? Yes. 
Um, Robert, I'd like to know uh, how do the the solar events affect data gathering from your sensors and the spacecraft that provide the data that you use to do all these pro, uh, projections with or predictions with? Um, for the most part, uh, we built the instruments with the idea that they have to survive these events and be able to continue to report on them. Um, now, in, uh, you know, that in, in the past, we've had, you know, sensors aboard the GOES spacecraft uh, that were damaged by flares, you know, and just permanently wrecked. Um, and so we learned from that, you know, try and make things more robust. Similarly, um, with the ACE spacecraft that monitored the solar wind, uh, there would be periods where we would lose the velocity data uh, because of an event and because of the particles associated with it. So um, we've built different instruments to try and overcome those things. So I think right now, in general, um, we're pretty robust uh, in terms of, of the space weather events and their impacts, specifically because we built those things with that in mind. Now, there's been a big push uh, for using small satellites and for using commercial providers of data. Now, these particular um, spacecraft are not necessarily built to monitor space weather. You know, we're kind of piggybacking on them, or they have some sensors that will try and pull data from them. I think those, you know, I, I really haven't worked with them enough, and we haven't seen them in action during space weather events uh, to know whether or not they'd be robust enough to continue to provide data through an event. So I think there are some unknowns out there as our, as our um, kind of paradigm shifts towards using smaller spacecraft and, and tapping into other sources of data. By the way, I need to back up on the VHF UHF thing. You know, I was thinking strictly in terms of ground communications. Now, if you've got satellite communications uh, through, the, through the ionosphere, that's a different story. Those are gonna be affected by the space weather events. Uh, so if you're doing you know, AMSAT stuff or anything like that, you know, there could be issues uh, based on um, scintillation phenomena in the ionosphere, depending on the frequency that you're using and how it's affected. Thanks, Rob. Anybody else with questions? Yeah, this is uh, John, KM4PEH. Um, I'm just curious if there's any risk to our radio equipment um, operating during an extreme event. I would say, um, based on what I know, um, there should not be a risk. You're not going to be looking at particles, um, you know, impacting the circuits on the radio. Um, you're not going to have things coming through the antenna. Uh, the the biggest risk, I guess, I could I could think of was um, interruptions in the power, in the power supply in the grid. Um, so, you know, for a for a large magnitude event, um, you know, the only thing I could think of is some type of interruption based on a power failure. So having backup power, I think, is you know a, a prudent thing. And during a big event, you know, it's gonna it's gonna shwack the ionosphere in a way that you know is probably gonna you know test your test your abilities, you know, to communicate and to uh, engineer around you know the particular environment. But I don't think it, you know. I don't think you need to go as far as putting things in Faraday cages or stuff like that, because I've gotten those questions. So Rob, um, I think I've heard you speak about the Carrington event, and that hasn't come up today. Can you give us a couple minutes on that? Yeah. So, 1859. And by the way, if you're interested in following up on this, there's a great book called The Sun King. And uh, have you read that? I have. It's a wonderful book. Isn't that amazing? I enjoyed it. Yeah. It's a mixture of Nova and Jerry Springer. It's absolutely insane. <laughs> you got huge scientific breakthroughs and adultery and stabbing. I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> it's got it all. But uh, so in 1859, there was a huge uh, flare that this gentleman Carrington witnessed from his observatory. And it was so strong that it was a white light flare. So it was visible. Uh, through his solar telescope that was projecting on a piece of paper, um, and he saw it, 
and he went to grab somebody and say, hey, come look at this. Um, and then uh, within hours, all the magnetometers in Kew Gardens and around the globe started going off um, because the CME had arrived. Now this was huge. Now you think about Aurora, you normally think about looking around the polar regions and stuff or the northern tier states. It drove the Aurora to Cuba. <laughs> That's crazy. It was so bright in Colorado that miners got up thinking it was dawn and started going to work until I assume somebody looked at their watch and went, hey, wait a minute. Um, people thought entire cities were on fire in the distance. Telegraph lines, which were the only real infrastructure that we had besides the railroads that involved very long conductors, uh, you know, over long distances that could pick up this induced magnetic field, um, and telegraph stations uh, could run without their batteries. They could communicate without their batteries. Um, they could, um, in some cases, uh, have issues that caused the telegraph station to catch fire. So that that was you know that was a significant event. And that's usually what people use as the touchstone for how bad can it be? You know how bad could it get? And what if you took a Carrington level storm and superimposed it on today's technological infrastructure? What kind of havoc would it wreak? Um, and this is a serious question. And that swarm effort I mentioned that was driven from the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the Executive Office. Um, and that continues today, one of the first questions they asked was, how bad can it get? And how do we understand how bad it can get? Because given our limited data, uh, in terms of space-based data, you think about it, that hasn't, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things, that's only been around for a tiny sliver of time. You know, how can we, um, how can we best understand what the threat is? How big can a solar flare be? You know, how strong can radio bursts be? Was the Carrington event the worst geomagnetic storm? Could it be worse than that? You know, how big of a particle event can we see? So all these questions are being addressed um, or you know, investigated by some of the, the leading researchers in the US and, and uh, in some cases around the world. Um, and and that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a, it's a significant challenge, it really is. And because these events are so rare, Trying to develop meaningful statistics and things is also difficult. So, you know, you've got risk and you've got a very small data set. So it's a, it's a very challenging problem. But people recognize that it's something we need to take seriously, which is good. And then briefly, if you could describe the one of the consumers of your data are the power uh, line operators. And what what information do they take and then what do they do when they get it and do they have enough time to act and what does that really mean to us okay those are good questions so typically what will happen is i'll call them and then i hear them after i tell them what's coming the weeping begins no i'm just kidding not really it's uh <laughs> No, we've got we've got a system set up where we can we can initiate a phone call with all the operators um, across the U.S., which is awesome. And uh, we bring them in, and we will tell them that hey, we've seen this coronal mass ejection, we've seen this CME, we think it's coming to Earth. It has the potential to produce a, a geomagnetic storm of, you know, some expected magnitude plus or minus, uh, because we got to give them error bars. Um, so that, that's usually the first step. We'll relay. Um, the fact that this thing has occurred, we'll give them a projection on what we think it's capable of doing. Um, but again, like I said, because we don't know that magnetic field, we can't be sure. But typically for large events um, that are fast, uh, they, can, they can produce significant effects um, as a rule. Um, so we make that notification, we issue a watch. Now, that gives them, depending on the speed of this thing, between 17 hours and four days to take actions. Uh, they can start making decisions about deferring maintenance or taking certain uh, production out of, out, of, uh, out of the loop or, or um, turning other systems on that can help mitigate things. Um, so those are some of the actions they can take. And then as it arrives, it becomes a question of, watching the evolution of the storm, keeping them informed about the evolution, 
and then uh, continuing to take actions to mitigate uh, those effects. And there's a kind of a standard uh, they've developed in the, there's two bodies. One is the uh, FERC and NERC. So the NERC is the National Electric Reliability I want to say council, NERC, and then there's FERC. FERC is the federal one because it has F. In any case, um, those two bodies work together uh, to try and develop uh, procedures and requirements um, for the grid uh, to deal with these effects. Now, like I said, the biggest, probably the biggest advent in this particular area is the development of that electric field model because now they'll have real time data that they can feed into models of their subsystem and make more precise decisions about how to mitigate the effects of these storms. Thank you. Uh, anybody it, else with questions? Yeah, yeah. does this affect uh, high power DC and AC lines differently? Um, I don't think I've ever looked at DC line. You know, the most, most of the time, all the uh, impacts I've looked at are on AC. Um, and we have one scientist who's specifically devoted to this particular problem, and he's developed the models for it. But uh, that's a good question. I do not know that we have looked at that at all. Um, so I can't answer that. Um, I do know, though, it gets into railroads, and it can, uh, it can cause problems with signaling. Um, and it gets into pipelines and can cause corrosion there. But uh, I'm going to write that down because I actually, that's an intriguing question. Yeah, there are large, uh, large DC transmission lines interspersed across the U.S. All right. Well, the other potential is that he's already looked at this and I just don't know it. So <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll double check with him. That's a, that's a good question, though. I can come back next time you meet maybe and have some answers for you. Well, great. I think that uh, probably ought to wrap things up. Uh, Rob, we really appreciate you taking your valuable time and spending it helping us learn about all this stuff. It's, uh, it's been great. Uh, well, I appreciate the opportunity. It's, uh, I love talking, as you can tell, I love talking about this stuff. And I, you know, it's, it's important. I feel very fortunate to actually be in, in both of these communities. Um, getting back into radio after after my long hiatus was just awesome. And it's just amazing to see everything that's going on in this community as well. Well, and one thing I'll tell the members, uh, it is possible now, they have suspended the tours, I believe, for the immediate future. But once things get back to normal, you can go to NOAA and have a tour for free. You have to call and make an appointment and then they'll schedule you in and they've stopped all the tours right now, but uh, it's definitely, if you have any interest in NOAA, uh, in addition to, or which is, is larger than the group that Rob works in, it, it does a lot of other things. Uh, it, it, it'd be an interesting tour to go on. I've tried to book it twice and I got snowed out both times and then COVID-19 out. So uh, I'm looking forward to it in 2021 if I can do it. All right. Well, things, I'll say this too. If things get back to normal um, and we're allowed to have people out there again, um, if, you, if you shoot me an email, I can try and, you know, at least get you in the Swipsy part of it, if nothing else. Oh, good. Good. I'd like to do that. Yeah. We'll get some guys from the club and we'll all go up and have lunch or something. Yeah. Be awesome.